Welcome into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I'm Tyler Donahue. He is Sean Fitz. And if you're listening or watching, we'd like to welcome you in. This is our first episode. We're going to be linking out to our YouTube page, which you can find uh, over there on YouTube at Penn State Nittany Lions on 24-7 Sports. Uh, Sean and I, you can see our mugs if that's what you're into. Uh, we'll be chatting about that from our respective houses. Sean at his place. Uh, I'm on the other side of uh, the, the Penn State Universe over here in Belfont. And uh, as you can see, set up in my daughter, incoming daughter's uh, nursery. This is kind of uh, my life right now, Sean. It's balancing Penn State football coverage, piecing together things in the nursery. This is where I'm setting up shop, but I will be evicted very soon. I'm going to have to find a place downstairs in the basement uh, for our future episodes. You got a lot going on. I'm sure your wife will be happy to find you a corner somewhere. But uh, no, nursery looks great. Uh, I hope you weren't trying to hide your daughter's uh, name or anything like that. But uh, there she is. Yes. But uh, no, it's a it, it's a new era here. We're going on video. Sorry to some of you people that are seeing us for the first time. Uh, I myself setting the bar low with my uh, with my regalia here. Um, but we're happy to come to you live because it's it's game week, and you're not here for to look at us. You're here to listen to uh, and and pay attention to what's going on with Penn State football. And by the way, I moved out of the way the sign that you can't see. We're going to have to remember that some people can see, some people can't. The name is Olive. It's plaster on the wall behind me. Uh, and my wife is uh, 35 weeks into this thing, so the countdown is definitely on here at my house. Countdown certainly on for the Penn State football program. Wisconsin, Penn State, 11 a.m. local time in Madison, Saturday. Sean, as we record here, we're under the 48-hour mark. There is just so much to learn about Penn State football and what this program is going to look like. It's it's really fascinating, but I got to tell you, the energy that we've gotten off of these calls with players coming off of the practice field yesterday with the coaches, you wake up this morning after the storm rolls through, it's 55 degrees uh, in, in the morning, it, there's a chill in the air. Man, I am so pumped to cover live football and, and really get to, to talk about this game when, when we get through it on Saturday. A year ago, there was so much uh, frustration from these guys just kind of boiling over from the, the the postponement of the season and so many things going on, guys opting out, whatever. Um, this year, you, you get a different feel. You get a different vibe from – we talked to Sean Clifford last night. You talked to a bunch of players this week. It just seems different. And it doesn't really mean much if you can't go out and, and get a victory on Saturday or set yourself up for a good season – but it does just feel a little cleaner this year. It just feels like it's, it's a little more normal. So that's always good to see. Um, James Franklin, of course, last night was he was, he was fairly cheery. I mean, it was fun. He is funny. back. He's all the way back. He put off that tweet during practice. Now it was a scheduled tweet. He came back and said later. Um, but he's telling jokes and things like that. And like I said, I don't know that they'll go over well. They go out to Wisconsin and get a and get a loss. But uh, he seems to be back. Uh, close to normal or as close to normal as they're going to, as they're going to get out of him. So um, it's good to see. It's good to see all around. I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a pretty tight bonded team. And speaking of tight bonds, Sean, there's a really cool story forming in the Nittany Lions defensive backfield right now. Jair Brown uh, confirmed as the starter next to J uh, Jaquan Brisker on Wednesday at practice. That was what we were anticipating. James Franklin didn't hold that back from us. And so these are two players that, you know, you know, the backstory here. They were both at Lackawanna College together in 2018. And, you know, they were it was not a foregone conclusion that they were going to end up together even there because Jair Brown's coming out of high school in Trenton. He was a three time all conference player. He was the New Jersey leader in steals on the basketball court. But grades were an issue. It was more that the testing was an issue. Didn't have a lot of options. Division three Montclair State said, hey, you want to come play for us? Wasn't a right fit. Lackawanna says, OK, five days from now, we got training camp opening. Do you want to be on the team? He ends up impressing in some scrimmage action. And who's there to welcome him into that defensive back room? It's Jaquan Brisker. And and obviously, he gets the Penn State a year ahead. He welcomes Jair Brown to town last year. He's made his move as, a, as an all-American kind of preseason player. And now here's Jair Brown stepping up to head up to Camp Randall Stadium with him. And what a tremendous story this is shaping up to be. And I just really like the trust that's in place with these two. And Terry Smith this morning uh, told us that he feels like this could be the missing piece that makes – Penn State, one of the top defensive backfields in college football. That's a lot of pressure on Jair Brown, sure uh, is. to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because Jair Brown doesn't have to be a superstar. He, You know, he's got Brisker beside him. He's got a pair of good corners there in Tariq Castro Fields and Joey Porter Jr. that are going to get start get the starts there. Um, so he's got to be solid. You know, he's got to be a guy that comes in, does his job, is in the right spot. Um, you know, if you're going to get beat, get beat trying to make a play or something like that. But he's got to be solid and just kind of let Brisker do his thing. Um, Brisker's so much more experienced. I 
think he's more talented as well. Um, but Brown, that's a that's a big step for him to go from where he was last year to being the starter this year. Um, still questions in that secondary about depth um, at that position. You're wondering about Keaton Ellis, Tyler Rudolph, John Sutherland could be back there as well. And Sutherland's also been at the Salmon camp. So a lot of you know, great stories, no doubt about it. And, and this is one when he was a recruit, he was just so happy to to get the offer and take that next step. And from where he came from, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, now it's time to, to buckle up and do it. So we're going to see what Jair Brown is about. We're going to see what Penn State can do in that secondary, because if he can be solid, if he can just be solid, that's a really good group right there. He got into into some action last year. He was involved in every game in one way, shape, or form. A lot of special teams, six total tackles. So there is a lot to learn about him in a very important role for Penn State. I do think, though, this is not the normal situation where you have a first-year starter trying to get used to the guy next to him. These are guys who consider each other brothers. They have played along each other at a different level of football, no doubt. But they got some time on the practice field now at Penn State, some games last year. They are as close as can be. And so I think that's worth noting here because safety, what do we say? Communication is so important. Uh, it's such a, a crucial factor in finding the right fit for your starter. And I think because of that bond and because of their time together, there was a bit of a built-in advantage. Plus, of course, Jaya Brown, you know, he could be a heck of a football player based on you know limited sample size and what we saw at the junior college level before this. And Brisker being back, I think, because there's a big impact there. A lot of trust, a lot of familiarity, and that's going to hopefully for those guys boil over into the field and they should be able to use that with communication and stuff like that. So uh, really interested to see how they play off of one another. Like I said, you're, you're, you're hoping for spectacular from Brisker. You're hoping for solid from Brown. And if you can get that, you can meet those two in the middle. And that's pretty that's a pretty good spot to be at safety. James Franklin saying we should expect to see other safeties rotated in. As Sean said, Keaton Nellis, Tyler Rudolph. Um, we're hearing good things about Jalen Reed, the freshman since he got to campus. Jonathan Sutherland, who did confirm this week, he, he has been splitting time continuously at linebacker, at safety, feels comfortable enough to contribute in either role. And let's move up to that next level of the defense because a guy that, that we're spotlighting and trying to figure out where his snaps are going to come on the field Saturday is Jesse Lucetta. Um, it has been kind of a practice by practice thing. Sometimes we've seen him with the defensive end. Sometimes we've seen him with the linebackers. Sometimes it's been a little bit of both. And that's really been his MO since they got back on the practice field in August. So I think based on what we're seeing, he's going to be more of a factor at defensive end. Um, and he may need to be right off the bat here at Wisconsin with what they're going to face and, and what we've already discussed in terms of depth at defensive end. They really like how this transition has gone for him. He's got plenty to prove in a new role, but this is a legitimate opportunity for Jesse Lucetta to kind of rewrite the narrative at Penn State, maybe set him up for set himself up for a future uh, at the next level. And there's probably slightly more value there being the third defensive end than, than being the second Mike or the, the second two and a half wheel or whatever it is. Um, so I, th I think having him there, especially in, in week one, right off the bat on the road, a guy has played a lot of football is going to be key for those uh, that, that defensive line. So I think probably a bigger role than we even expected. You know, you, you, you say a guy is going to split time and, and you wonder, does he ever break through at either one of those positions? They view him as a starter at both spots. So, uh, you know, hopefully for his sake, you know, spell Tarbert and spell Evocati. Um, whatever he can do to to sort of make it make an impact, maybe you slide him down the line in a pass rushing situation, something like that. They they seem like they're expanding his role for a reason, and I'm I'm really curious to see how that plays out in terms of snap counts on Saturday. Another guy who's splitting time this on both sides of the ball, though, is Marquise Wilson. Uh, Terry Smith uh, earlier today here on, on Thursday confirming he is available to play for Penn State on offense and on defense at Wisconsin. Uh, last glimpse at, on the practice field, we saw him working with the wide receivers. As we've said, a lot of playmaking ability there with Marquise Wilson. We've seen it at cornerback. Could we see it flash on offense early this season, uh, that's a question. And we still have some questions about how it's going to sort out with the wide receiver rotation. Um, how about the running back rotation, Sean? That's been a big question mark. Noah Kane, Kevon Lee, we've talked about that being the lead two. They want to use three. Uh, based on what we saw this week, it seems like Devin Ford, Keziah Holmes right there in the mix. I think Devin Ford, according to James Franklin, going to be a factor on kickoff returns. We mentioned that's probably going to be an impact from the running back room here in 2021. Uh, Ford getting some some uh, you know some some praise. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it praise. I, I would say he he got a pat on the back from James Franklin on Wednesday night about his efforts and his progress um, during the preseason and, and, and heading up here. Because let's remember, Sean, he was publicly challenged by James Franklin and Jay Wan Sider this spring. 
Yeah, and and you get closer to the season, you say, what's this guy's role going to be? Well, he has one, which, to be honest with you, this is a guy that we took a look at and said, if he hits the portal in the offseason, maybe that's a, a situation that wouldn't surprise a ton of people. He's back. He was probably going in as the third guy right there. Noah Kane and Kevon Lee uh, seem to be heading up the drills. John Lovett, by the way, um, we saw a practice last night, really wasn't factoring into that rotation at all. So I, you like to have three backs ready to go. It seems like Devin Ford's probably the third guy as well as the kickoff return guy. Um, so if he can get a spark, and, and like we said last year, Devin Ford's not an every-down guy. He's not a guy that's, that you want carrying the ball 20, 25 times. You've got a couple of guys in front of you that that kind of fit that bill a little bit better. Um, but if, if he can carve out a role, catch some passes, do something to help this team, I mean, he can he can be in a good spot because that's uh, where where we viewed him last year and where we view him this year. It's kind of the same expectation. Obviously, it didn't go that it didn't go as well last year with the injuries um, to to the guys in front of him. But yeah, he's going to have to be a little bit more 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 mature. He's going to have to be ready for you know to to, to kind of handle that role and to roll out whatever he's uh, whatever they need him to do. And as you noted last night, Sean, he's in playing shape. Devin I, Ford I, has I, never lacked the yeah, physicality. Yeah, <laughs> he's got 12 abs. Um, he's got enough for the both of us. Um, is, is the third down back still a thing? I mean, that that's kind of something that, you know, has come and gone. And, and Penn State typically doesn't do something like that. They do the the rotations based on, uh, the, you know, who – I guess the whole uh, the whole set, but the third down back is is sort of how you could pigeonhole him if you were trying to do so. Um, a guy that can do different things out for you out of the backfield. We know he's a tremendous uh, all around skilled football player, but he hasn't really done it physically at the Big Ten level. Um, so if you can get him in there in a slash role, you've got an opportunity to to make the most out of Devin Ford. Last episode, we talked about the team captains that were selected, and, and Sean and I both pointed to Rashid Walker as as one that really stands out based on where he was when he came to campus in 2018. Confirmation on that from his teammates, from the coaching staff in some conversations this week. James Franklin really making it sound like the jump that Rashid Walker made from 2020 to 2021 is one of the more impressive one-year jumps that they've seen during their time with this program. And and we've heard similar uh, kind of sentiments from Dwight Galt. He, he didn't make it seem that way. He, he flat out came out and said, he sure did, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said, that's the, that's the biggest jump that we've had. Um, and hopefully for Walker, it's true. I mean, they, they seem comfortable with him uh, playing left tackle. Sean Clifford seems very comfortable with him guarding his blind side. Uh, Walker's always been tremendously talented. You're just waiting for him to tap that potential uh, maturity, a big thing there when he got to campus. And that's something he's worked on. And like you said, when you've got a, a potential paycheck, like he's got at the, you know, waiting for him in a year, that changes some things. So hopefully that the light has come on for him and thought he was pretty good last year, but I think he, he can be great. I mean, he's really, he's got that kind of talent. Looking for a leap. Let's talk Sean Clifford. Uh, we got a chance to do that last night after James Franklin spoke with us. It was QB one back in the spotlight. We've had him you know, pretty frequently over the course of this year, documenting uh, his progression with Mike Yersich. Uh, early on, a lot of the conversation this spring was about what happened last year. At some point, Sean said, I'm done talking about 2020. Let's talk 2021. And I felt like you know, we kind of got to the finish line of this offseason with Sean on Wednesday night. And you know, he was pretty candid, and, and that's often the case with Sean, but uh, a guy that acknowledges that he has been really pushed uh, by Mike Yersich in an aggressive way, in a demanding way, and he says that's exactly what he needed at this point in his career. Well, he needed a reset is what he needed. And, uh, you know, I, I can see, like I said, I've, I've defended Kirk Shiraka quite a bit on this podcast, but, you know, sometimes your quarterback needs something completely different. And this is something completely different. Mike Yersich has been a different presence on the practice field. He's been a guy that, uh, you know, probably, you know, th- there's probably some back and forth there that's not meant for television. And, and that's something that's probably good for Clifford, knowing his, um, you know, his for lack of a better word, attitude and his his approach to things. Confidence has never been an issue. Even when he's not playing well, confidence kind of has turned into an issue. Overconfidence turned into an issue. Um, but he seemed ready to go. Um, credit where credit's due. He probably looked as sharp on Wednesday night as we've seen him. Now, none of that stuff matters until, <laughs> in, until Saturday. Uh, live bullets are flying, and that's a, that's a very different situation. That's a situation we've seen Sean Clifford in before, and that's a situation that, you know, he did not handle well last year. So, um, very curious where he stands on Saturday because we can talk about this stuff all 
you know, all week long and do four podcasts a week on it if we wanted to. Um, but until it goes live, I mean, there's, there's just questions you can't answer. And that's, unfortunately, that's the off season. The off season is so long and you ask the same questions over and over again, and you just don't know until it gets there. And that's the thing with Sean Clifford. And, um, you know, hopefully he makes that jump. Mike Yersich seems like it's, he's given him a kick in the pants and is ready to, to get going. He had, a great Mike Yersich comment, which is probably one of the better ones that we've had from any player in the last year or so. He said, Mike Yersich is a thermostat, not a thermometer. I uh, got a lot of play on our board at Lions 24-7, but he sets the tone. He doesn't wait for the tone to be set for him. That's that's not how that meant to that, that was meant to come out. Um, but he's gonna he, he's really gonna set the pace and everyone's gonna either fall in behind him or you know, not not be a part of it. So curious to see how this marriage works out, and we're gonna find out in a couple of days. He runs a pressurized practice setting, and the goal of that is to make things simpler and easier on Saturdays. That, that's that's the plan, and, that, and that's why you take that approach. We didn't get to see Kirk Shiraka on the practice field a single time during his, his days here, but his demeanor and, and, and just knowing him a bit from before, very different than Mike Yersich. I can't stress that enough. I think a lot of people do realize that, but um, I had a chance to spend a little bit of time with him at the Rutgers uh, off the recruiting office and, and in that staff uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago at this point. And, you know, it's very laid back, a calm demeanor. And I, I do wonder, there were some comments from Jahan Dotson this week that, that he said it felt like Sean Clifford had a lot of stuff off his shoulders this year compared to last year. And I just think with the team scattered a bit, with a lot of pressure on individual players and, and experienced players and starters to, to set the tone. I wonder how much of a coach he was over the course of 2020, as much as he was a player who was sharpening up his craft. And if that got in the way a little bit, because Jahan Dotson says Clifford had too much on his plate last year. And a lot of that has been alleviated by Mike Yersich. To your point, you got 60 minutes of football on Saturday to prove it. He called himself the most confident quarterback in the country on Wednesday. He didn't need to say it. He wanted to say it. That's great. We've heard a lot of confidence from him over his career going back to his high school career. We talked about that a lot. If he can back that up, come home from Madison with a victory over the Badgers, he's going to look awesome. If he goes there and, it's, and lays a dud, he's going to come back to town with egg on his face and have to talk to us again next week. 24-7 Sports tweeted out that graphic with his quote in there this morning. And of course, the first response was alerting old takes exposed, uh, freezing cold takes. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens on Saturday. But every conversation, I'm sure we'll talk about it again in this episode. <laughs> but every so. conversation, right back to Sean Clifford. And that's where we go. You had Terry Smith today, um, a little bit of availability every week during the season, every Thursday during the season, an assistant coach is available to the media to talk a little bit about that. He's got a good group of corners. He's got a, also a couple of young corners that seem to be uh, making their way up. But uh it's uh, it's your show. You were the one on the call, so I'm 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 tired of covering for you. <laughs> well, Terry Terry Smith's always fantastic on these calls. Uh, we, I wish we could get him on a weekly basis, and he's also the defensive recruiting coordinator, so we could pick his brain there. But really, it was the defensive secondary in focus. We talked about the safeties. We talked about the cornerbacks. I mentioned earlier him saying that Jair Brown uh, feels like a a a link in the chain that can make this a really special group. Um, but he also has a lot of confidence in some of those other players. Keaton Ellis, of course, who he knows well from the cornerback room. But talk about a guy who's gained confidence this summer that I didn't really see it coming in, in terms of his ascension in the conversation right now, especially in that position room. Daquan Hardy, you know, the 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 Mr. Irrelevant of the recruiting class that year. And of course, it's much different than the draft, but he's a guy that got added last second in that draft that he was going to go or in that class. He was probably going to end up in the Mac, um, ends up in that group, extremely productive player at the high school level, but undersized, you think maybe for the big 10 level. And uh, he, he, we're going to see a lot of him in that star role. Sounds like that's his job to lose. We saw him there late um, during the 2021 se during the 2020 season. It was Lamont, Wade's job early and he did lose it. Um, so we'll see. John Dixon is going to put up a fight. He's played a lot of football at South Carolina the last couple of years. And I think the fact that Daquan Party has put himself in a position says a lot about his savviness because, he, you know, we've heard he's got to rely a lot on, on, on being a guy who is, is not just you know, physically impressive and speedy, but he's got to be fundamentally there and he's got to be able to outwork you in that regard because of that size deficiency in most of the matchups and sounds like he's put it all together. And you know, one of the, one of the more pleasant surprises, I think coming out of Penn state's preseason camp. 
Yeah, and he was he was not good last year. Just not not good enough. Um, you know, Penn State got really thin at corner at the end of the year, and um, you know they, they he was picked on, and that's one of those things where he's going to he's ne- you know he's never going to be the bigger guy. He's always going to give up size, and and offensive coordinators are always going to try to exploit that, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Wisconsin's receivers pretty big group of receivers. Um, so we'll see what happens this weekend, but uh, yeah, he's, he's done some nice things in camp sort of come out and won that job. I know there were questions about Johnny Dixon because he, you know, Johnny Dixon was out here running with the starters in spring and things like that. Um, but Hardy came out there, won that job. And and we've seen a couple of clips from practice that he seems to, I don't want to say he, he lost the swagger or anything like that, but he seems to be fully confident right now heading into the 2021 season. Listed five foot nine, 180 pounds. He was listed 160 pounds when he showed up to campus back in 2019. So uh, ha- has come a long way. And, and what a cornerback group they got in 2019. Of course, now Keaton Ellis contributing at safety. Marquise Wilson contributing at receiver. You got Joey Porter Jr. Who you know it, it, we're kind of just like saying, okay, set it and forget it with, with Joey Porter Jr. Terry Smith basically like he's got to do his job. He's got all these physical tools. You've already seen it. We like the way he played as a freshman. Just keep doing it. Uh, you know, with, with Joey Porter Jr., I think he's a guy whose personality we're still getting to know compared to some of the other guys in this room. We, we know Tariq Castro Field so well by now. We're getting to know Jaquan Brisker very well. Um, Keaton Ellis, I think we've gotten to know quite a bit over the years. And this is kind of a guy that I look forward to learning more about during his second year as a starter. And, and we've talked about it as much ceiling maybe of anybody on this defensive roster in terms of next level talent. Yeah, certainly it's it's a good corner room, but in terms of draftability or things like that, Porter's got everything you want. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm really curious to see what kind of strides he can make this year. Um, as a guy that they're going to be leaning on heavily, uh, can play man, can play zone, can do a lot of things really well. Um, you know, he's 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 more athletic than than he was as a high school recruit, and that's kind of what held him back a little bit. Thought he was a four six guy, he came in and was a four four guy. Doesn't happen all that often, if it ever. Um, but Joey Porter was able to do that. So um, he has not grown into the linebacker that we thought he might when he was a recruit, but uh, he's pretty darn good at corner. So I, you feel comfortable there. And and obviously guarding guys one-on-one, very, very tough thing to do. Nobody ever acknowledges how tough it is to be a cornerback. Um, but you, you feel pretty solid about those two going into uh, going into the season. And a huge stage for Tariq Castro Fields. Um, we have seen him come up big on on huge stages, but you know we've also seen him get picked on. Uh, of course, the Minnesota game comes to mind in 2019. He was not healthy down the stretch, and then he was not healthy much last year. So plenty to prove for him. He already said it's going to be a very emotional moment for him getting back on the field. He watched the final six games last season. You wonder if along the way he thought he was done with his Penn State career and he was going to uh, try to figure out what was next and, and move on to the NFL. Sticks around back in that starting lineup. Um, from a fifth-year guy to a first-year guy, this is a name that has surfaced a little bit here as the season gets underway. Not just Jalen Reed in that defensive backfield at safety, but Zaki Wheatley coming up from Maryland earlier this year, getting some love from Terry Smith today, and and that's starting to become a bit of a trend here. What's what's funny there is you you know you said about forgetting about Joey Porter. Kalen King just doesn't seem. Oh, like by the way, Kalen King. Yeah, <laughs> Kalen King's your third corner as a true yes. freshman, and you don't even think about him in that light anymore. Just you know, Jalen Reed still seems like a new guy. Uh, Zaki Wheatley, who you mentioned, still seems like a new guy. Kalen King feels like he's been around forever, even though he just got here in January. He's going to play a lot uh, as well. Zaki Wheatley caught my eye last week at practice. Um, he's working out with the corners. Probably one of those situations you want him to get experience as a corner. Um, in coverage and, and learning how to, to stick with man-to-man coverage and things like that, and then eventually moving him down to safety just because he's so long. Um, but he's it seems to have taken the corner pretty well, and he's a long, flowy athlete, um, kind of looks like Porter did when Porter was a freshman, um, just lanky and arms and leg, limbs everywhere. Um, so we'll, we'll see where his – I don't expect him to factor in right away, mm-hmm. but – he didn't have the foreign team jersey on this week, so that's that says something about his development. Just very very quickly, um, you know, I th- still think he's probably what a sixth corner or something like that, uh, maybe even seventh with, with factoring Marquise Wilson in there. Um, but that's a that's a really good start for Zaki Wheatley. He's a guy that didn't play um, much as a senior, if at all. I get, I'm kind of foggy on the details. I know they had canceled it, and they maybe had a game or two. 
Um, but it was one of those situations where he, you weren't sure what he was getting when he got there. And, and even before that, you didn't expect him to be an, an early contributor. So if they can get him out there, maybe get him out there for a couple of games this year, get some experience and see what you've got. And maybe you've got something corner. It's, it's harder to stick a corner than it is to stick at safety sometimes. And, and maybe you can figure that out and, Moving forward, you lose Tariq Castro Fields next year. Joey Porter Jr., not saying he's going to go to the draft, but he has that opportunity if he needs to. Um, so you're going to need corners moving forward. And by the way, speaking of uh, defensive backs out of Maryland, K.J. Winston getting a fourth star uh, from 24-7 Sports this week. Penn State commit down at the Matha Catholic. Brian Doan had a write-up on that on lines247.com. We're going to get into Wisconsin preview now, Sean, because uh, we, we had a lot of help with that earlier in the week, and we're going to continue to tap into our 24-7 network of analysts each week to get a better look at the opponent. Uh, we got to talk about week one, and and let's lay it out there. Uh, to me, last year was certainly a mystery because we were going into the season in, in, in late October, and, and we hadn't seen the team, and we were all sitting at home for months. But this has a, a different level of mystery to it. I, I really don't have a great feel for this Penn State team. I But if I'm leaning boom or bust, I've got them picked for nine wins. We put our season predictions up. I had them at nine and three. So do you. So does Mark Brennan. We all landed at nine wins. But if you're saying, okay, which side, boom or bust, I think there's major boom potential uh, just because I, I have a hard time going too far down the path of buying into everything we're hearing that sounds so awesome about this team this week, just because you can let your imagination run wild, but we haven't seen it. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen scrimmages from this team. I, there's so much that we don't know how guys are going to be utilized and, and what some approaches are going to be and what personnel packages are going to look like. And they're going to have tricks up their sleeves. And will this defense be flying around and looking, uh, you know, collectively like a unit that in a way that we didn't see in 2020, those are things I'm not quite ready to just say the benefit of the doubt gets tossed on all that. But I certainly think there is a major launch potential for this program. And, and I do think that beyond o Ohio state, we may be seeing the best two teams in the big 10, uh, in action on Saturday. I, you know, it, it's funny because I get what you're saying and four and five takes an awful lot of that benefit of the doubt out. And I know mm -hmm. we, we kind of trash 2020 and throw, you know, throw it to the side. And I know Wisconsin's done the same thing. Um, but you, you know, you can have your doubts. We were optimistic last year. Penn state did have the benefit of the doubt coming off of a cotton bowl win this year. It's kind of in the show me state type thing. Um, and, and Sean Clifford's right at the top of that, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other guys out there. We expect, you know, we expect Brandon Smith to have a great year, but Brandon Smith has some growing to do to, to have a great year. You know, just there's, there's guys like that all over the place. So I think that that's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a well-made point on your end, but at the same time, you know, that benefit of the doubt kind of evaporated a little bit with last season. Um, now, this game is really interesting because Wisconsin kind of coming off the same uh, outlook. I know they had some COVID issues last year, missed some games, but, uh, you know, up very high to start the season. Down low in the middle of the season, uh, Graham Mertz uh, was was a guy that got banged up and their offense really suffered because of it. Um, end of the end of the season on a high note in the bowl game against Wake Forest, but um, you're not really sure what to make of it. And you you had Mike on from uh, from the, uh, our Wisconsin site earlier this week, and he was kind of felt the same way. And it's just like, is is this the Wisconsin team? Uh, what what Wisconsin team do you expect? And then really, when you peel away the layers, which Wisconsin team are you going to get? And it's funny because I, I thought about this when I was making lunch today. Is we talked all all year about okay, uh, Hakeem Beeman playing defensive end because of this power running game from Wisconsin. Wisconsin's power running game isn't their feature this year. And, and, and it's, it's interesting because you always think great offensive line, big running, big bruising running back, um, you know, a quarterback that's going to play there for seven years and just manage the game <laughs> the entire time. Um, it, it, it's not really that at all. And, and they're expecting bigger things from their offense, but they're expecting it from the passing side of the game. Um, they, they've got questions at running back. I know they've had some personnel transition at running back. I, uh, you know, Jalen Berger was a guy that, you know, was on Penn state's radar for a long time. We thought he was going to be the starter. The Clemson transfer is going to be the starter instead. So very interesting to me to see that this might not be the Wisconsin team that, that people really thought it, thought it was even a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, I think they're going to try and throw the ball. I think they're going to try and spread some things out more than we expect. And, and there's, there's a curve there. This Wisconsin spreading things out means going three receivers. Not, I don't think they're going to go five wide and try to throw it around the yard. Um, but I, I just think it's a very interesting Wisconsin team. Are they as good as what are they 12 in the country right now? 
I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I forget, but you can say the same thing about Penn State. Yeah, well, Penn State 19, Wisconsin 12. Josh Pate, who I have a lot of respect for his views on, on college football, and I think a lot of our listeners do. After Certainly he was a on. lot of our listeners do as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got Penn State at 9, and he's got Wisconsin at 8. So regardless of how you look at it, you're looking at two teams – that I expect to look like top 25 programs. I think they're going to look like top 25 squads when we see them. I don't know if they'll look like top 10 teams. Um, you know, someone's got to lose this game, but I do think both of these teams, when we come out of this, will think that they belong in the conversation as a top 25 squad, belong in the conversation as a top tier Big Ten team, probably still chasing Ohio State like everybody else. But um, Ches Malusi is that Clemson transfer who came in has the starting job, and I do wonder what they're going to do there uh, because it's, it's kind of what we're waiting to see with Penn State. Is it a set rotation? Are they going to go with a hot hand? Uh, you know, It's not going to be a, a Jonathan Taylor situation where you give the guy 35 carries and figure it out along the way. Um, so they're going to have to figure out a divide. They certainly, I think, are going to want to give Graham Mertz an opportunity just like Penn State wants to give Sean Clifford an opportunity to go out there and prove he can be a, a very capable trigger man who can get the ball into his playmaker's hand, but also be a playmaker on his own. And you look at how their 2020 seasons went last year, it was kind of polar opposites. You had Sean Clifford start out with a complete spiral and then, you know, kind of find some solid footing toward the, toward the tail end of the season with that win streak. He didn't play off the charts, but the, the stats were much better. The turnovers were way down during the four game win streak. Graham Mertz, on the other hand, came out, lit it up on, in the opener. I think he had seven touchdowns, no interceptions through the first two games. The rest of the way, Sean, two touchdowns, five interceptions, and he's a guy that that was the quarterback for a team that failed to score more than seven points three times. So two programs that say, hey, we think we got a lot of pieces put together to maybe end up in Indianapolis if, if things go right. But we also have a lot of questions about the quarterback coming off of a 2020 season. And they also have a top 25 opponent in, in week one, both of them. Yeah. And that's, that's really interesting because how, how quickly is, are these teams going to be able to warm up? You know, how, how quickly can these guys get going? 11 a.m. Uh, you know, a big play. Uh, yeah. I mean, this, this could just, I, everything always happens the opposite, but this has the script of a, of a very slow first half and, you know, kind of feeling their way out and somebody will take the opening kickoff back for a touchdown now. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's very interesting to see how you know, on both sides of the ball, how they will sort of gel because there's no, um, you know, there's no Mac opponent week one. There's no FCS opponent week one to get yourself prepared for this. And you're gonna have to learn on the fly. And that's going to be tough for those. Um, and also is grammar. It's good. Like I, that's the thing. Like I, mm -hmm. I know he's talented. I've, you know, scouted him a couple of years ago, immensely talented, but he's a good college quarterback. We don't know that yet. And look, he is the top rated recruit at that position, the premier position in football for that program, which which has a lot of history at Wisconsin. So when you have that tag, I think people are going to set that bar much higher than, than it probably should be at when you're early on in your career. But I think the, the question here is you got two quarterbacks uh, who have played games but Sean Clifford has played a lot. Uh, if you got to start on the road this year and you got to start against a top 25 opponent, it really helps, I think, to have a quarterback who has seen this kind of an environment. And Sean Clifford's seen it. You know, he's played at Columbus. He's played in Iowa City. Uh, these were challenging atmospheres. And, and I think that's going to be a built-in advantage. You want to see Sean Clifford stay within himself during pregame. We, we know he's gotten excitable, and that hasn't translated well uh, in key moments for this team. That can't happen again. He's got to be beyond that point in his career now. But I'll tell you what, I think it's I think it certainly is something that's a bit of a safety net. And, of course, it's funny I'm saying that because we're all waiting to see if Sean Clifford turns the ball over a bunch of times like we saw last year during the start. But it, it, it makes you feel a little more comfortable than if you were trying to, to, to have a guy like Taquan Roberson, for instance, take on his first start at Camp Randall Stadium. Yeah, that's where it's really interesting. I think the veteran quarterbacks in the Big Ten going to fare better just as a whole this year. So, you know, hopefully for, for our listeners sake, Sean Clifford's part of that equation. Um, defensively kind of is, you know, is your grandfather's Wisconsin team strong up the middle. Uh, Keanu Benton nose tackle is really, really good. I had a really good camp. Um, the same guy has played middle linebacker for Wisconsin for 15 years. Um, it's just a carbon. <laughs> they just, it's just an assembly line. They just keep pumping them out. Um, but uh, secondary is going to be interesting. Apparently they have plans to follow around Jahan Dotson. Is that what you read this morning? 
That's what I read. Uh, that's what I read. And, uh, and, and I, I, don't, I don't, I don't recommend it. You know, that's just, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know how good these guys are, but John that's, Dotson, uh, that's not, that's not the guy I'd follow around, but then, yeah. Again, not, I'm keep not, an eye built for corner. So keep keep an eye on number one cornerback Fayon Dix because he was the one who made that statement. He said he wanted to see just how good Jahan Dotson was on Saturday. And I'll tell you this, Sean, um, win or lose, I think John Dotson's going to have a have a day for himself on Saturday. I think that's where this Wisconsin defense is susceptible. I really like what they can do in the front seven. I think they're going to bring in extra blisters. They're going to try to make Sean Clifford feel uncomfortable. Why wouldn't you after what you've seen from Sean Clifford? You want to test that early, see how he's reacting, see if he's getting the ball out of his hands quickly, see if he's comfortable with his reads. We know by now that if Sean Clifford is on, you know early, and if he's not, you're no early. Maybe maybe he's moved on from that period of his career too, but I'm not sure. Uh, and I think Wisconsin is going to test him hard. And if he can beat them and, and, and he can say, okay, you blitz me, uh, I'm in sync with my receivers. I got this new offensive coordinator. I feel comfortable. I'm the most confident quarterback in the country. I know where I'm delivering the ball. And and I think that could really set things up to open things up for your for your deep for your uh, running back group. And this is a team at Penn State. If you can build a lead, you have the horses in that backfield to put a game away. Noah Kane, Kevon Lee, those are both high quality closers. I mean, you'd love to get in a situation where you have an advantage here early. I think this one goes all the way down to the wire, Sean. Hanging in the bounce, final half of the of the of the fourth quarter. But I do think that w- w- with Sean Clifford. Um, they are going to try to attack him early and, and see what he's about here in, in 2021. You absolutely have to uh, attack him early. That's the that's the blueprint that that we you know there's there's a lot of experience there, but there's also a lot of game on tape that these coaches can look at and say just go right after him, see if you can make it make it work. Um, that's where things come into play, like these short passes. I think the hitches will be there, um, and because of that certain little not gimmicky things but double move hitch and goes i mean jahan dotson can have an opportunity especially for a wisconsin secondary that's going to be amped up to cover him to make a double move to get let to get loose to get you know deep down the field just off of some simple things so i'm really interested to see how how they handle that but i but i agree i agree 100 percent. you got to come out if you're wisconsin you got to come after clifford um you've got some some really good players on that defense some really athletic players on defense and and if you're penn state you got to get the ball out early you got to get him confident Use those tight ends close to the line of scrimmage. I mean, if you need to take seven yards at a completion, take it, go with it, um, see what you can do. And then hopefully you find yourself in a game. And I know that, you know, you go on the road in the Big Ten, especially early in the season, um, you have a tendency to shell up a little bit. Um, but yeah, win that field position game. I think the, the punting game, as you would say in a Penn State, Wisconsin game is going to be very important. Um, so it's it, it, it'll be uh, very I, I wouldn't expect the unexpected this weekend just based off of, um, you know, we think that, that it's pretty cut and dry game plan for Sean Clifford to make Sean Clifford comfortable. And if and if he can do that, you know, that there's a route to, to Penn State winning this game. Jack Sanborn is the guy you want to avoid becoming a game wrecker for Wisconsin. I think he's that 17th year linebacker that, that Sean was referencing. Uh, they had a couple defensive ends have strong camps, according to, to, to what we heard on Monday. And from Matt Hensington, uh, Isaiah Mullins off the edge. Rodis Johnson is a name that maybe Penn State fans remember from the recruiting trail a few years ago. Uh, he looks to be making a move as a guy off the edge. Uh, but I do think that Penn State's weapons, the speed on the perimeter, and quite frankly, what they're going to get out of that tight end room can present a lot of problems for Wisconsin secondary. To me, if they can protect Clifford and he's prepared to, to, to deliver the ball, there are going to be, because of that athleticism, guys in space, Theo Johnson, Parker Washington. There's just a lot of dudes out there for Penn State. We've said this whole time. He's going to have all conference quality supporting cast in a lot of areas of the field this year. Can Sean Clifford capitalize on all of that? Get the ball out to the edge. Um Every season we see it, and we'll probably see it from Penn State on Saturday as well. Secondary tackling early in the season sucks. Uh, it, it always sucks. Uh, so we'll see what happens. You can get, like I said, the hitch game should be there. And if Jahan Dotson or if Parker Washington, somebody like that, can shake somebody and, and, and get past them, that could be your route to a big play. It doesn't have to be a 50-yard bomb down the field. Um, you certainly make it uh, work like that. By the way, uh, Wisconsin in 2021 signed Brian Sanborn, the younger brother of, uh, of Jack Sanborn. So they've got another one in the pipeline. Uh, just copy and paste the exact same scouting report on, on Jack. There must always be a Sanborn in Madison, uh, I think is the rule there. And Sean, I, well, can we talk about the other team's tight end? Because he's he could be a problem for Penn State. Jake Ferguson, 
Um, you know, I, I think you, you, they bring back Danny Davis. That's big for them. Kendrick Pryor, both of those guys were lost for much of the season. You had Mertz banged up. You can kind of put it all together and understand why Wisconsin's offense sputtered uh, over the course of, of last season. But Davis is back. Pryor is back. I, I think both of those guys are talented players on the edge. They have chemistry. They had early season success last year with Mertz. But to me, Jake Ferguson is the guy that, that you can't let beat you, especially on those crucial third downs, especially in red zone situations. He had three touchdown catches in the opener last year. Um, and, and I think really he, he probably is Graham Mertz's favorite target. And to me, he's probably pretty far and away the favorite to be the Big Ten tight end of the year this year. Yeah, I think he's, you know, certainly right up there. I'm going to put up some big numbers. Um, that That's really where I'm looking at one of the key matchups. You got Ferguson. Uh, does he play a traditional tight end role? And how much pressure does that put on Jair Brown? Or do, does he do what Penn State does, put him in the slot and see if he has to go up against Daquan Hardy? If he's up against Daquan Hardy, oh. that's going to be a tough draw for Hardy because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's given up a lot of size. Uh, Chimeri Dyke is, is another guy. I believe it was highlighted on the episode earlier this week with Mike um, that could get into the slot and can do, do a lot of things for you. Um, so those two guys, their matchup on the inside, I think is going to be key for, uh, for Penn state's defense to figure out where those guys are at all times. You know, about Davis, you know, about the, the two guys on the outside. Um, but those two guys on the interior, on, on the interior of the passing attack are going to be very important to know where those guys are the entire time. And, and how about Curtis Jacobs? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm really curious still to see exactly how prevalent he is out there and taking snaps and staying on the field and third down because everything you hear about this guy is he's tailor-made to defend the pass. He's got those safety qualities. He's exactly what you want at that Sam, uh, at that Sam linebacker position and the best potentially that they've had in terms of a fit still really curious to see exactly what that means over the course of these four quarters at Wisconsin. You're absolutely right. I mean, what what happens when Ellis Brooks has to stay on the field on a third down and, and Jacobs comes off? That's that's not a uh, great recipe if you're talking about strictly pass coverage and things like that. So um, another one of those subplots that you're wondering where, um, you know, just in the middle of the field where those guys are going to show up. So, yeah, I'm very curious to see how that Sam uh, linebacker spot plays into what Wisconsin's trying to do. Because like we said, this isn't uh, – I, I don't know that this is one where you've got to – play with five man front that you have to, you know, put eight guys in the box to stop Wisconsin's running attack. And Wisconsin's running attack is fine. It's just not what you've become accustomed to believing Wisconsin's running back should be. I know that uh, our guy Evan flood over at the Wisconsin site, you know, uh, expressed some, some negativity in terms of what uh, they expect uh, out of that running game. Not so much the, the, the criticism of, of, of the staff or where they're at, but it's just, it's just not the same. I mean, we, we, we saw the same thing when, when Saquon left. I mean, the expectations are so high. It's similar. I mean, you just expect to plug and play there when you go to Wisconsin. Yeah. And and the offensive line, uh, you know, I'm not convinced this is, you know, the, 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 the best offensive line uh, in the big 10. A lot of people just say, okay, that's gotta be Wisconsin um, because they're Wisconsin, but they did dodge some bullets. It looks like during preseason camp, they had a couple of health concerns. It it seems like they're pretty settled in, although, you know, you're never sure. You're never sure how you know, because when guys are are you know mixing and matching during their preseason camp, uh, they were without Tyler Beach, their starting left tackle for a lot of camp. Is that something that Penn State can exploit? Was there a lack of snaps? Could there be a lack of continuity? Because we did hear earlier this week there was a lot of moving parts on the offensive front for them during preseason camp, and you know, that's something that Penn State seemed to be able to avoid. And you'd think they'll benefit from that on the offensive front. What can Penn State do with their defensive front? That is a mystery to me. We talked about the linebackers. Is Brandon Smith ready to be a, a, a dominant kind of defender like he's been built to be coming out of high school and like the stage is set right now uh, over at the Will linebacker spot? And what are you getting out of defensive end? To me, it's a guy that we have spotlighted a lot lately. Arnold Ebikede, welcome to the Big Ten. Go get Graham Mertz. Just right away. Just go get him. <laughs> Just do that thing. Um, Luketta also big in there. Tar Burton, who we haven't seen anything from a live standpoint that that would give us one way or the other on his uh, on his game those guys are paramount importance i think they'll be fine i think penn state will be fine up the middle um this uh this weekend but you look on the outside and those guys you know you get tired quickly i'm not sure what the weather report is for for madison on saturday but it's early in the season everybody always has uh issues with conditioning early in the season so we'll see where that happens i'm also concerned or not concerned i'm also curious on the edge on the other side because they've, they've had to replace some guys at defensive end for wisconsin what what is interesting to me penn state's tight ends block really well Brenton Strange, Theo Johnson block really well. If you can 
you know, bust down on that edge, and especially at defensive end where they're, they're breaking in some new guys. Uh, the interior looks very strong. I mentioned Keanu Benton earlier. Um, but if you can get to that edge and get those tight ends blocking and, and play some 12 personnel and sort of do to Wisconsin what you expect Wisconsin to do to you, Penn State can have some success running that outside zone and, and getting the getting the running game to the outside. So I'm very curious to see if that's the direction Penn State can go this weekend because uh, if they can do that and get to the outside, we mentioned tackling issues always uh, pr- crop up in the uh, early stages of the schedule. Um, they're they're going to have an opportunity to do so. Wisconsin, a little bit like Penn State on the defensive front, they've got a lot of bodies. They got a lot of uh, physical profiles that they like, athletic profiles that they like, but not a lot of experience and not a lot of proven commodities. Uh, so some similar similarities there. And you'd expect in this kind of a matchup, the trenches are going to tr- determine everything. And again, with this running back group, and especially those top two guys, Sean, the ability to run the ball in this game and do it early against Wisconsin. If Penn State can do that, um, they're going to be tough to deal with all year long. Um, it's one of those things we, we just, it's, we're always cautious now to, to go too far <laughs> down the road and saying the offensive line is, is the best we've seen of the Franklin era because people get mad at us real fast. Yeah, we, we don't say that anymore. <laughs> we, we, we stopped that a few years ago. People still think we say it, but we don't say it. Um, by the way, Wisconsin and Iowa, the two best in the big 10 at taking the play or finding the players that fit how they like to play and fit their scheme, which is why they outperform the recruiting rankings pretty much every year. Uh, Wisconsin, you, you can't say enough about their player development and the way that they've been able to find those guys that it's not a great, it's not an easy place to recruit. It's not an easy area to to pull kids uh from and to um but it's they've done a really nice job with it and just like penn state they're trying to put 2020 as far behind them as possible four and three was not what they were looking for the 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 stretch of that season was pretty ugly they missed a couple games with covid issues uh in those matchups and then you look at what they did in the the last four years just like penn state double digit win totals in three of four seasons so what are they? We're not sure. A lot to prove on Saturday, uh, but it's time to predict. We had to give our season predictions, and like I said, it feels like as difficult as it ever has in, in, in my uh, five seasons covering Penn State to, to figure out where this team is going into its first game. Um, I do think, again, both these teams are going to show up ready to play. Jaquan Brisker said the goal for Penn State is to start fast. That's great. I think that, that that's that's a great goal. I, I don't think you want to get in a situation where you fizzle out, though, where you, you, you invest so much energy at the start of this thing and, and it fizzles out. You want to see a steady performance, a consistent performance. It's got to be the tone setter there has to be Sean Clifford. And and really curious to see how it goes between him and Mike Yurcich and their exchanges on the sidelines and, and what it's all going to look like from this offense. I'm excited to see it. But like bef- like I said before and like you said, the benefit of the doubt to me, I'm just not comfortable jumping completely on board with it right now with, with Penn State going on the road. Half their roster, more than half their roster, has not entered an environment like this. And yeah. it's just a, it's a lot to ask for. it. And I just want to make that point again. That's a lot to ask for. Penn State has one of the, the more difficult hands dealt to them coming out of this pandemic from a matchup perspective compared to pretty much anybody in college football. It's a tough one. If they come home with a win, they may be capable of doing just about anything as this year progresses. And I just want to say, if they come home with a loss, I think it's going to be a loss that leaves you thinking this is still a team that can go win nine, 10 games over the course of the year. I think they lose though. 27, uh, 24 is where I'm going. I don't think it's a, uh, it's a fun one at the end there. I, I think those points that, that are decisive are scored in the final five, six minutes, another very tough week one road loss in the big 10, We can see how they respond back in Beaver Stadium on Saturday. Got to do a lot better with that than they did in 2020. I think they will, but I've got them starting 0-1. I I hope we're both wrong (laughs) because I have them uh, falling 24-21. Close game, slow game to start. Um, You know, this is probably a game where – if you play it at Beaver Stadium, Penn State wins. If you play it at Wisconsin, Wisconsin wins. I think the, the home team has the advantage very much so um, in this situation, scheduling, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it will be very interesting to see how it plays out. Again, it's all on Sean Clifford. And, you know, I'm kind of believe it when I see it mode. If he comes out and beats Wisconsin by 30, great. You know, it, then maybe I'll believe it. But uh, it is, there's a long uh you know, it's, it's been a long off season and I don't think it's ready to, to, I don't think I'm ready to buck that trend just yet. Hopefully for Penn State's sake, 
Clifford has found it and has turned it on. But uh, right now, until that happens, it's it's tough to to be all that confident. But I think Penn State plays well. I think, uh, like I said, it's going to be slow. It's going to be uh, one of those things where you're kind of waiting for the, the the game to take shape, and we'll see if if it does on Saturday. And I think the narrative about Mertz and Madison is very similar. There's 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 a lot of conversations like the one we're having about Clifford, about him. And I'm completely with you. If if we were covering this game in Beaver Stadium a few miles away, I would absolutely be picking Penn State to win. That's just the way I see it. I do think they'll get out, out of September with a three and one record, but I think that they, they're gonna have to start with an 0 and one hole. Those are our picks. I got 27, 24. He's got 24, 21, and he's got a dog. And just in time for us to wrap up. Uh, this episode of the Lions 24-7 podcast, which again, check it out on YouTube if you weren't watching. We appreciate you checking that out at Penn State Nittany Lions on 24-7 Sports on YouTube. Throw your five-star mailbag question up on Apple Podcasts. We'll get to that as soon as we can. Uh, and really fun to preview a game. We'll recap a game on Saturday. It's our post-game podcast coming your way here on the Lions 24-7 podcast. On behalf of Sean and our producer, Lance Glenn, I'm Tyler Donahue. Talk to you on game day.